Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for what you're doing in our midst and around the world and through your body. We ask that you, God, continually to help us. Lord, you see the sick. You see the things among us that we are asking for you to move. We thank you and we love you. And again, uh, just thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we've been on the theme of worship and praise. And I would like to, again, today talk from the same perspective, but from looking at it, how it affects God. And in the Bible, it talks about a way that it does affect God, and it's his glory. It's part of who he is. So we're going to talk about God's glory, the glory, and what that means in Scripture and what it means for us. Uh, my wife is going to read a few expressions of the glory that the Bible talks about. Exodus 24, 15 to 18 in the in New International Version. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Exodus 34, 5 to 8. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the fourth, third, and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. Exodus 40, 34 to 35. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. There's many scriptures and passages in the old uh, that talk about God's glory and how there was sometimes a supernatural manifestation of his glory and there's things that happen and there was sometimes a weightiness that caused the people to uh, maybe respond in a frightful way, sometimes in just a heavy way where they just couldn't really move but they knew God's presence and that he was there. And as we move through scripture, especially in the New Testament, we see God's glory demonstrated in another way. Uh, we see that more in the person of Jesus Christ and how now God is relating through him who he is. Uh, as his son, as his having the obedience of his father. Also, we see that Jesus does manifest some uh, supernatural things in his expression. We have Moses and them, I mean, not Moses, but uh, Peter and them, when they go up on the uh, Mount Figuration and, and God and Jesus are together, and there's a part of that manifestation again. But we also see it too when Jesus dies and Mary goes into the tomb then the glory again is on God, on Jesus Christ the person. But then we see something different later, which I'll come back to, when the church is born, as we know it today, the body of Christ, and how his glory is manifested in a different way. It's not that it's any different, but the expression is more through a different uh, uh, vessel, which we believe would be the Holy Spirit, and even in us as believers. So we'll come back to that a little bit. I think sometimes we're more struck by the awesomeness of the glory of God, and we tend to sometimes be a little frightful of that, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing and we shouldn't do that, 
but it seems like here now in our time of human existence, we seem to attach more of a fear of being around the glory of God. Something that seems to be wanting to harm us more than embrace us and more of God coming because he's happy and because we're worshiping and he wants to be in our midst. So he just releases himself in a way that is beyond our own reality, but it's yet is in our reality and we're able to sense it or see it. And again, I'm not saying that none of that's bad or wrong, but sometimes it forces us in thinking that we don't want to really embrace that. We, we only think that'll come up when we've done something wrong and God is out to get us and judge us. But in reality, uh, as you study the scripture, God's desire is to reveal his glory to you. He wants his glory to be a part of you. Why? Because he's in relationship with you. He loves you. He wants the fullness of all that he is that you can hold. Now, yes, obviously God is going to limit it to the power and stuff here in our uh, body because now, unlike uh, the Garden of Eden, we have a debt to pay, which is death. And, and so God has to get around that and not necessarily expose all of that he would because that might cause that penalty to be paid and you literally fall dead over the overwhelmness of God's goodness. So God doesn't really want to do that. So there are times when God, yes, does hold himself back so that doesn't happen. But at the same token, God still wants to reveal his fullness to you. And he is... Wanting to do that on an indivisible basis, he wants to do that on a uh, corporate basis when you have a bunch of people who are together in a prayer group or in a group like this where we're getting together. And then he wants to do that on a level when you're just off with God by yourself, however you worship, however you read the word, you know, all those things. He still wants to reveal his goodness, his glory, all of that he is to you. And then he wants you to understand the approach is one of the things that Jesus said when they begin to recognize some of his glory and some of the, the ability he had to heal and to, uh, cast out devils and all those things that Jesus was doing. And there was a time when some children came up to him to honor him and love on him. And the people thought, well, you know, he's really being doing these things that are really great and stuff, as though the children would belittle God, Jesus, this person that they were considering some level of a, a priest or some level of a prophet. You know, they started to understand this man has some godly powers here. We can't keep denying this reality. Not everybody accepted that, but the majority of the people at that time did that was around that region. And they said, no, don't let the kids, as though that would be a violation or some way that would assault the glory of God. And Jesus said, no, 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 don't do that. As a matter of fact, I want you to model this attitude that these children have. And be joyful. Come to me trusting me. Come to me as though you know I don't mean anything but good to you. And you want to play and you want to be a part of that. Even though you don't have enough intelligence because you're young, like children, to understand all of this and see it in a way that maybe an adult would see it with his reasoning and understanding, but still have this childlike trust, this childlike understanding that I want you to have. And we kind of lose that or we don't quite get that. And it's kind of like, in a home where there is real love and the family and the children know that there's times when mom and dad's room is off limits unless you have a purpose or they call you. So they know that's not really the place to play. But the same token, they also understand if I'm frightened or I need to be hold, it's kind of okay for me to ask or go in to mama and daddy's room and climb up on the bed. 
because I need that reinsurance right now. And the parent understands that, and they're willing to, yeah, come on, come on. And, and maybe sometimes when they're sick or things aren't going right, they may even call, honey, come on, I want, come lay on the bed with me. And it's that childlikeness that God is wanting us to understand. This, this is my private spot. I mean, a bed is kind of your private spot for you and your husband, or if you're single, you don't want anybody just doing whatever on your bed because it's kind of a personal, private thing. Well, that's the same kind of attitude God wanted us to say, see is, where my privateness is, where all my oneness is, I want you to come up upon that and be a part so I can express the love I have for you and you get a part to receive it by actually being in that environment. So it's though God's environment now is there for you to actually step into without the fear of being consumed, without the fear of being judged, uh, in one of the scriptures she read, it talks about God's glory being there, and yet God is uh, talking how he loves, but at the same token, he's also, they're establishing that he's the God that will judge. He's the God that will deal with some things, and that's true. But at this particular moment, he wants to love you, even if you've done something wrong. I mean, you didn't do the best yet. Uh, this mom and dad realizes that this was a stressful thing for you, maybe because you didn't get the best grades or something that you were really trying to do and it didn't turn out the way. And that this is their way of allowing you to come into my space, daughter, son, and be where I am private and come share that with me so I can encourage you and tell you everything is going to be okay. Let you know that you can do this. And that also let you know this more than anything. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. Okay, I understand your pain. I understand the fact that you tried hard and yet you didn't get everything you thought you were going to get out of this thing. I'm here to celebrate who you are. And I still believe you and I still trust you and I still love you. And it's that part of God's glory that I believe with all of my being right now. That God wants to bring that level to this earth because we're in bad need of it right now. And we're talking about believers, not just the sinful world that rejects God. They need it too. But we do. Because we look around and sometimes it's almost impossible not to lose hope, not to be caught up in the fear of things, because things aren't great today in a lot of ways. I mean, we're blessed here, but still we see things that are unraveling and, and then you're not sure what could happen. And these are real realities. But as a believer, I believe God wants to visit us in special ways where his glory engulfs us because we're worshiping him. We're giving everything we have to him in our relationship, serving him uh, in the church, serving him out when we go to work. Uh, like Pastor Bill, you know, he's pastor here, but when he goes out on the job, he doesn't preach necessary, but he's still walking as a pastor. He still has a heart to care for people. He still has a heart to express. And when he does a job, I'm convinced, just listening to him, he's still going to relate that God job in a way as though he's still a pastor. So he has to do it in a loving, caring way. So you don't think he's just a grubby thing and he's just a mean boss. He wants to bring that part of who he is into his relationship without making you feel like you're a sinner or making you feel like there's no hope. But he's bringing his experience of what he believes and how he now manages and supervises. Am I right with that? I mean, I can hear that from you. I believe it. That's, that. And that's still God's glory and that the people who he works around start realizing like there's something different about this particular manager. And there may be other Christian managers that feel the same, but they can see there's something different. And if I'm going to be in trouble, if I made a mistake, I hope it's <laughs> the bill comes around and be the one to correct me and not so-and-so because then I'm all, you know, going to jump, be jumped. Well, he's going to be more passionate and he's going to be more caring about trying to how to fix this and how to help me do better. What I'm trying to say here is that there's a level of God's glory right now that he has given to Jesus and Jesus, through giving it, through the relation of the Holy Spirit that now lives in every true believer, God, his Holy Spirit, the glory is resident in you. And God wants us to be able to 
get that. And there are times when things aren't going great for you, whether it's a physical sickness or any other thing that you're dealing with that seems to be very hard. Sometimes just getting off by yourself and wrapping yourself up in who's in you and allowing that part of the Holy Spirit to soothe your very being and to help relax you and help you feel better about the situation, even though there's things in it that you can't control. And it might make your day kind of rough just because you can't control all these other things that are real. And it's not that sometimes I do hear people teaching that if trouble's around you and you're a believer, then maybe you're not doing something right and God's out to get you. There's a lot of people that say that, and in the way they say it, I totally disagree with that. I do believe that God may uh, deal with you on some things, but however God deals with you, it's through his glory and goodness, and it's not about him crippling you. It's about him helping you walk to a better level of how to deal with these situations where you still reflect who you now are as a living child of the living God. And what's in him is now in you. And he's trying to help you mature in certain levels that you maybe have, but you're not right yet mature. Like a little child sometimes still has to learn. They know right and wrong, but now they got to learn how they process it in a more mature way and deal with doing right in a very tough more complex situation, such as it's easy to obey mom and dad at home, but when you get in school and you have other things that play in that, it's a little bit hard. Not that you're trying to do wrong, there's just other things that are played into that. And it's like still, God wants us to never not reflect who he is. So there's never a time God says it's okay for you to just set me aside and then reflect something else. God wants us to get to the level, no matter what I go through, I'm allowing that which is in me, the light, the truth, the peace, the joy, come out that when it's said and done, that's the expression that is left. That, hey, there's something different about this person and how they handle this situation. That is, again, a part of the glory of God now resonated in you through the Holy Spirit and helping you walk and show the fruits of his goodness that's now in your life. And now that we're being more challenged in some of the things that are going around our world, I think we need to embrace that more in our situations and in our challenges that we face. Especially when we deal with someone for whatever reasons, have decided their life job is to make sure God understands they don't like him. And since you represent God, then they want to make sure you understand they don't like you nor your God. So they're constantly trying to do things that insult you or things that test you. And if you do something, oh, yeah, I thought you was a Christian. Why you? you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, we know where all that comes from, but the point is we now need more of the glory of God that we rest on to deal with these situations that are being targeted in a lots of time to believers. I mean, there, there's an agenda out there to go after people that are bold enough or willing to say, I love God, or willing to pray out in the open and not be pushy, but just do it. And yet those who have made it their passion to say you can't do that because I don't like God and I want nothing to do with him. And so the very fact that you are showing how you love God, you offended me. So I'm going to let you know that. And if I can have a law or something that stops you, I'm going to do that. And that's happening more and more. I believe in this time now that God wants us to be able to respond with his glory in a way that we react different. Not that we necessarily have to accept that or not challenge that, but in a way, again, the reflection is forgiveness comes out of it. I understand for whatever reason you're upset and for whatever reason, uh, 
Since you don't really like me praying, may I ask what upsets you so about it? That person might say, well, why do you want to know it? That'll help me pray better for you since if I understand why you're so upset. And it's a way of still saying, I'm not going to respond the way you are responding to me. I'm responding the way God called me to respond and take this as an opportunity so you will know God still loves you. I want to learn how to love you. And the only way I'm going to be able to do this is through the glory that resonates in me. And I want you to know I don't like what you said, but I want to use that opportunity that you can see I'm really on your side. And I really want you to know this God the way I know it. And it seems like sometimes we think it's part of, if we find someone who doesn't want to be around the glory of God, then we ought to be on the defensive and make sure we let them know that God's not pleased with that. And because he's not pleased with it, he can't wait to send you somewhere you're not going to like. And that's kind of the message sometimes we send, rather than saying to that same person, God really loves you. And I don't know what you've been through to make you think or feel or respond the way you're responding that makes you feel that God has your number and he's always been out to get you. And I'm interested in why you feel that way. Is it because you really gave your life to God and he cheated you or did something? And in some cases, a person may say, yeah, because I went to, you know, and, and, and then we're able to hear that and able to, again, God help me love this person. Help me kind of show them there's another side and not everybody's like that. But I still think we won't be able to really respond that way if we don't allow the glory of God that's in us to respond that way that we can demonstrate that because God is demonstrating it to us and now we're taking advantage of this opportunity that may not be a good one, but yet it's a good one because it's a chance to show the goodness of God. Jesus is standing before this lady who has done wrong and people say you ought to pass judgment since you are calling yourself or we are willing to accept that you have some level of God's authority, so get her. Well, the first thing Jesus does is demonstrate to them that if we're going to go that route, then let's go across the board. And since you can't really do it because you got faults of your own, so if we're going to judge her, then you're willing, once we judge her, for you to get in her spot so we can judge you, then let's proceed. And they go, oh, no, we don't want to do that. They walk off where he has the opportunity to judge her willingly, rightly, and he has no sin, so he's qualified to do it, what does he do? He shows love, he allows the glory of God to come upon this person, and she walks away whole with hope. And realizing there's hope for me. And B probably was one of the ones, nobody knows specifically, might have been one of the ones within the room in the 120. Definitely might have wind up being one of the followers of Jesus. That's the kind of glory that God is still wanting to show. But I do believe that we're going to witness a phenomenon of supernatural value that is directly from God. And I believe that there's going to be scenes throughout our world and out our country and I'm praying specifically even here, where the glory of God shows up and we recognize that his presence is here and things happen that there's no explanation other than it's the power of God. It's not because I'm talking or anybody else is talking. It's other than God has decided to show up in our presence and for us to be aware of it and see his magnificent love and grace. And whenever he does, things don't seem stay the same. And it will be a change for the better 
and not a change of condemnation, not a change of judgment, but just a change of that now we've got a chance to actually see and feel the weighty heavens, uh, weighty heaven power of weightiness of God in our presence, and we walk away refreshed and renewed. And I think God wants to do that. I, want, I think God wants to do that. And there are people who have dreamed for years that some of that's going to happen and there's supposed to be places where you'll see that. And I'm kind of hoping for that. But I really do believe that there is a stirring in the heavens. God wants to bring a level of his glory that can be touched and seen just like in the Old Testament. And he wants to do that not so he can judge, not that he won't later, but not so that his love, his goodness, the reality of wholeness that is in heaven, he's bringing here where it's needed really right now. Wholeness. A sense of the power and neatness of God in a way that the very simple people that we are now a priest. Every believer is considered a priest in scripture. You have the same level that the priests of old to bring the sins and the hurts of the people before your God and ask for help, ask for forgiveness, ask for a change to make things better. That's what their job was to do. And the blood has already been shared which is Jesus Christ. So we don't have to do a lot of ceremonies and stuff to make that happen. Not that it's bad if you do have some special things you're doing, but it's already done because Jesus has died. But now he wants us to walk in our priesthood, whether it's on your job as a nanny or your job as a president and everything else that in between. God wants us to be a part of his reality here on earth in a fallen world who badly needs him. And God still wants to redeem this earth. Even though he knows maybe the majority percentage, percentage of the earth may reject him, millions, that's not stopping God for those who will. Because he created, I believe in scripture, every living human being for the purpose of having fellowship with. Not so he could later judge them and put them in hell. That's not why he created you. And I'm convinced of that through studying scripture that he created you to have fellowship and to see his goodness and his greatness. Now, because we are in a fallen world, there will be a re cleansing and a replenishing so there's going to be a time when God will have to bring and clean destruction. And I guess it mentions, and I don't quite understand all of that, but I guess by fire or however God's going to do that. But there will be a rebuilding in the universe of God. And people will be able to fellowship with him, even though we may have new bodies and, and some of us are dead and, and now we're alive in the new body. But in any event, God wants us to finish what he started and developing people that he can love and fellowship with. And really the Bible says there are going to be kingdoms. There are going to be things that we're actually going to do. We're not going to be just sitting around playing harps. Not that we won't do some of that. But God has a world out there. and He's willing to, when he reestablished the universe, that all the things are contrary to him are in a place where they can be contrary for the rest of eternity and not bother what's going on. But God's heart and desire is that his goodness overwhelms you. That you have a right and a privilege to represent your God. Just like a child has the right and the privilege to represent his family and to say, I am so-and-so and my dad and mom, they're so-and-so and I'm proud to be one because this child knows his parents love him, his grandparents love him 
and they mean everything to each other. That's how God wants us to see him and to see him now that way. Yesterday in this group that I go to and this young brother and we were talking and he says in praying and talking, he says, I want the God's perfect goodwill for you. And I said, he already doing that. Okay. I'm not saying that it won't change and even I'll see another part of that. But God's already doing that right now for me. And I believe he's doing that for you because God always wants his best for you. Okay. Now, that may change in seasons and get better and deeper. But there's never not a time that God doesn't want his best. And he says, if you're wondering about that, look at the worst or the smallest creature that you may consider. And he used a robin. Yet I meet all his needs. Why would I not meet yours when you're more created in a reflection of me? God wants the best for you always. And he has it now. Part of the problem, though, and I used to be there myself, we assume what that means. So we walk around with a measurement like you do with a thermometer and seeing if it fits the right temperature. If it does, and I have this proof that says it does, then I accept it's a certain way. Don't do that with God. Okay? Just know, even in the worst of your situations, God is still trying to bring the best for you in that situation. And sometimes, oh Jesus, sometimes, in order to take something and turn it into something better, there's got to be a lot of shaking, cutting, and cleaning to get it there. And sometimes we have to go through that. And it's not because we're necessarily doing wrong. In, in, in Job's, uh, Job's case, he was doing what God wanted him to do. But God still had another level of relationship for Job to understand. Another level of loving him even greater than he loved him at the time. And it took that experience for Job to see that. And it experienced that. And in the end, God says to Job, I kind of appreciate you standing there with your friends and being a representative for me. But really, Job, you wasn't there when I created all these things. So don't assume because you know me that you know how I think and that you know all these things because you wasn't there when I created these things. So we have to understand there is a difference of who God is that I'll never be able to embrace. I won't be able to understand. What I need to be concerned is what God is allowing me to embrace and allowing me to understand. Now, enjoy that and walk in that. And he will give you all that you need in that. So I think when you worship God and when you praise God, he's anxious and waiting for the opportunity to come in your midst and show up and show you all that he is and all that you are now. And that you, in essence, are the answer to a world that feels hopelessness, that is in fear, and that is serving a many of false gods that will never meet their needs. You know a God that can, you know a God that loves them, and you know a God that already made the preparations for them to be in relationship with him. So seize the opportunity to walk in the glory that God has for your life that you can make it so others can see it. And I thank you for listening in Jesus' name.